<clears throat> right, folks, end of early here, joined by uh, Stephen Poach for another for another week. Uh, obviously, we're touching touching on the, the matches the last day in terms of the double, obviously, double Mayo, Derry Cork, uh, our, our man and, 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 and Kerry, Kerry and Tyrone. So it was uh, it was an interesting weekend of football, I have to say. But uh, Stevie, how are you getting on? What's the story? Yeah. Not too bad, I don't know, but more importantly, how are you after uh, <laughs> the, the private messages and all you were getting? Yeah, yeah. Great yeah, fans. Yeah, uh, yeah. Fans, said, well, look, at, look at, you know, when I'm wrong, I'll admit when I'm wrong. But uh, look at, I just, I just, um, yeah, as someone said, I didn't realize Kerry got so excited over a quarterfinal victory. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, there were there were obviously there were there were a dog with a bit between their teeth. Like you know, they they obviously had been 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 seasoned by some of the maybe the criticism that has been labelled their way. But look, we weren't on our own end uh, in in sort of questioning. You know, we had our we had our doubts about them. Uh, but you know, one thing for me was uh, the level of defensive intensity that Kerry brought. Without you know. Their their intensity out of possession of the ball was the, was the highlight for me, you know, and that's that's something that that can be sort of you know, people look at all the sexy stuff and they you know they look at Clifford and they look at the scores and they look at the goals, yeah. but but you can sort of gauge a team's performance by the level of defensive <coughs> intent without you know how hungry they are without the ball. And Dublin, I think Ray Boyne had a tweet up after the Dublin game saying something like Dublin had 127 efforts. To tackle or, or or hook or block or whatever he, he described it as in comparison to Mayo 63 mm-hmm. which we'll talk about later but Kerry I would love to have seen the stats from Kerry's game you know as regards the, the, the tackle account they nearly done yeah. the Jerome with under them a number of exactly. years ago you know? and, yeah. and and that sort of real defensive animal that, that that you know that was in them last year Paddy Talley brought a steal this last year a real stubbornness defensively I know in days gone by, it's been called puke football, naughty style, Ulster mentality, blah, blah, blah. But Kerry relabeled it last year as tracking back and working hard. So that's what that's what, what, it, what it's called when you have 13, 14 men behind the ball now. But the, uh, but no, but on a serious note, you know, they, they, they had a real, real aggression about their play. But at the same time, Tyrone were below par. Tyrone were below par. And I know Tyrone people would be the first to admit that they were below par. But I, I do think, and... Uh, even if Tyrone had have brought probably their best performance of the year, I still think they would have failed short on Saturday past. What What do you think, Stevie? In terms of look at, I'm very sure this is a stat uh, that you know tells the tale of the game. And Tyrone had 19 turnovers. Uh, look at that's that's a bit of two sides there, as you said. They're ferocious tackling. That Kerry Kerry came came on yeah. on, on Saturday, and then obviously Tyrone's poor execution in terms of the basic skills of the game here. But that's that that's that just kind of shook me like I like 19 turnovers yeah. is just incredible for an interview yeah. to get yeah look it, it's it is like you have 19 turnovers at club level you'd be disappointed you know and, and look it's it's a wee bit it's a wee bit like roles reversed so go back to 2020 um 2023 or sorry 2021 when Tyrone won the All-Ireland the Covid year uh, yeah. where, where you know the, the, the competition was delayed because Tyrone took Covid but in that year and uh what you had was you had a prime example of everything carried on wrong. Solo the ball in the contact on Tyrone's yeah. 45. Tyrone broke at pace. Peter Hart broke with the ball. Um, two passes later, it was slipped to, to McKenna, who, who's back in Australia now. He went round the keeper and slipped it into the empty net. You know, this, one of the goals that McShane scored as well, over the top kick out, you know, flicked on, Kerry left exposed. You know, and those were those were, were, were probably elements of the game that Kerry learned an awful, awful lot from, you know, a couple of seasons ago. Not not getting caught in Tyrone's spider web. Yeah. That was that was the big thing. But but even then I didn't even think and that Tyrone did anything defensively to really ask carry any questions you know and that was the that was probably the most disappointing thing from a Tyrone perspective that didn't really see that edge but didn't really see that that tyrone that you would probably call it you know where they where they bring that real you know, you know dogged mentality and and look in every team and uh, and particularly on Sunday sitting watching the two games on Sunday I went down to Crow Park on Sunday and I was watching the two games and like the level of physicality in Dublin's forward line is frightening mm-hmm. The Tyrone forward line on paper looked scary and it looked a real, a real potent attacking threat, but not outside of, of um, Matty Donnelly. No real huge out and out, you know, massive ball winning potential there. You know, probably probably forwards that could do damage, but probably need a mixture of of maybe a, a, a you know, a, a ball winning forward. You look at the physicality yeah. in the 
for example, of Clifford there and his ability to win ball and things like that. So, but look, the big man for Kerry stood up, and uh, you know, Sean O'Shea had one five, one three from play. Yeah, uh, Damon O'Connor had one two from play. You know, Clifford, uh, Clifford, albeit he was, he was held to two points from play, but still had a major influence in the game. But look, Kerry will be very, very pleased with with their performance, and uh, and they'll be going into the semi final now very, very confident. I will say, like I will say, I don't think you know. Obviously, it was it was very comprehensive, and uh, in the end, like I know, I'm gonna I'm gonna half dig myself a hole here. I do, I don't think like look, if they're gonna face Derry the next day. I don't think Derry are gonna give them the, them turnovers. It's gonna be a more structured game. Look at if a, a Kerry person would be lying to us here if they you know really felt confident going into that quarter final there against Tyrone. Like you know the signs all year weren't exactly positive in terms of they had a very slow start. But look, there's uh, numerous ways to win North Ireland. Um, in terms of, I, I remember back to 09 when, when Kerry were, were started very slow and then they had a massive win against Dublin in the quarter final and to really kickstart their season. Like So look, at it's it's um, Jim O'Connor, as you mentioned there, we're all about the midfield. Look at open mm-hmm. country, no, no better. No better. Uh, the two of them are absolute Great. Oh, it's, 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 Aggressive attacking half backs, you know, Tom O'Sullivan can attack as well, he can drive forward, you know. And look, they have that, and then obviously they have the superstar, you know. And, and this is the point I've made to you as well you have King Kong, you, you have King Kong, you have Clifford, and you have Shane McGuigan, you know, in the last in the last four. Uh, Monaghan obviously have an aging Manzi, but he's still he's still a phenomenal, you know, a clutch moment man, you know, for even yeah. the free right at the death, you know, the free he, he executed as well in front of the. <laughs> You know, a, a man for all seasons, like, and an owes Monaghan football absolutely nothing. Like, but every team that's in the last four now has that real standout marquee, marquee forward, you know. And we, we talked about it earlier in the year, and that we sort of we, we had a bit of a laugh about our top four or whatever, our top five forwards, you know. And we probably would have had, you know, three of those, yeah. you know, players in, in the top five, you know. And that's that that's what separates a team, and like, people. It's brilliant having, you know, a defensive organisation, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't have the forward power, there's not really much you can do. And I, and I think I, the way the game, the I way the game's evolved, I just think you need 16, 17 scores now, you know, to win, to win big games, you know. I actually think the two of us had, I don't know what in order, but uh, Clifford's, Khan and McGregor in the top three. So it's just an interesting point you said there. In the, it's no coincidence they're in the, the top four now, the last four coming into yeah. it, like... Um, so look, it's, just, it's it, it, things happen out of nothing. You know they can, yeah. You know it's not even just so much what they're doing on the ball; it's what they're doing off the ball and what they're doing to the opposition off the ball, and that they're directing one of the best defenders. So, for example, next Sunday, Chrissy McCaig will one hundred percent go to to Clifford, and you know when when Derry lose possession, there'll probably be another plus one, you know, floating about in that vicinity to, to, to define where Clifford is and to spot his runs and and maybe cut out marks, etc. So, like you're occupying the opposition in 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 more ways than one. And it's not even from a scoring threat that you're that you're that, that he might hurt you from. You know what I mean? He's creating space for others. Like Shawnee O'Shea with one five the other day. Yeah. Maybe O'Connor with one two. Maybe all the all the attention all week, all the talk all week is Clifford, Clifford, Clifford. You know. So it does. It takes that sort of superstar po- forward to to really make you a contender. Now I think, Andy. You know. So like <clears throat> like Tyrone didn't really go ultra defensive, Stevie. Either like maybe you said the turnovers that kind of threw me off in the telly. Like uh, in terms of yeah, they, they just maybe. They, they might have just got plus one at the back, but I suppose when you're turning over the ball so much, you're you're kind of facing, you're chasing, you're you're chasing your own tail, you're you're facing your own goal, running back the way. So it's obviously going to be hard to defend. Like, well, there was a very interesting interview three days ago from Brian Duher. Um, the exact quote from Duher was that Kerry play football the way you want to play football. Now that's that's all well well and good saying that, but if you don't have the players to play that particular brand of football, you know you have to find ways to win. And I just think Tyrone are better when they find ways to win. You know, in their own unique style. You know, Tyrone throughout the years have always been regarded as you know defensively organised first and foremost, and uh, and then build from there. You know, just like Derry have done over the last number of years. You know, it's been a defensive template that they've built out from, and now they've obviously added their offensive game as well. I know it's slow it's methodical it's 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 maybe hard in the eye but 
all they're interested in is winning games. And, and I don't think anybody in Tyrone would have cared if they had to get over the line 12-11 on Saturday past. If it had been the worst fucking game that we've ever fucking seen in Crow Park, I don't think anyone in Tyrone would have been complaining. I don't think anybody in the Tyrone panel would have been upset. You know, but but to come away with, with such a massive defeat, like it, it probably, it makes you think probably as a group then and maybe individually and collectively, just we're, we're as far away as a lighthouse here, you know, and that's that's hard to regroup from, you know. It really, really is. Yeah, like, look, at, I suppose, is it, is it any coincidence too, Stephen, that three out of four teams that have been three weeks in a row here are out of the championship? Like, that's another, you know, in terms of, you know, even look at, obviously, Mayo the last day, Antaron, really high intensity first half, but then literally, started the second half, they kind of fell apart and just slowly, gradually, the, the two teams just kind of, uh, drifted away from them here, like that is, like yeah, if, you, could, you could perceivably argue that Armagh probably probably should have shaded that game, you know, based on yeah. on the chances they created and based on on you know the the fact that they probably you know will deem themselves unlucky with the timekeeping and stuff, which, yeah. which is an issue, and we can chat about that when we come to that game. But one hundred percent, I think I think we chatted about it on the show last week. It was very very hard to foresee, and uh, what was actually going to happen. It was extremely it was extremely hard, in fact, to predict. You know, would it be the team that's coming in with momentum be, be in a better position than the team who's coming in fresh? But it obviously shows that you 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 have rewards and and rewards are worth finishing top of the group, you know, because you have that two week window then to prepare. So I think teams now moving forward next year, it's not a format that I particularly like. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't like it. I've said this before. I feel very very strongly about it. Um, I think I think that the championship is championship. Uh, there shouldn't be a league and then a championship and then another league. I don't agree with that at all. Uh, I know the provincials, you know, are, are, are probably coming to the end, but next year this format probably will be in for another year. Um, and teams will probably look at this thinking, well, we need to finish top of the group because finishing top of the group gives us a seeded quarter final, and it also gives us an opportunity to regroup for two weeks and get a rest and recovery and then build again, which at this level is is absolutely huge, you know. Um. Where do where do Tyrone go from here? Lastly, do you think Drew or um, I would Tyrone? say you have a good management team in Tyrone. Um, I I would nearly bet one hundred percent that you would have a new management team in Tyrone. They've done three years now. They've won in All Ireland. You know the 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 the, the legacy for for those two men is 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 in Sense. stone now. You know they've won in, they've won in All Ireland. You know what more can you ask for? There's only four All Irelands ever been won in Tyrone. You know Mickey Hart won three of them. You know so they're the, they're the only second managers ever in Tyrone's history. You know to to win an All Ireland title, which which is a huge achievement, regardless of what anyone says about the circumstances and what happened. You need luck, and you need luck. You need everything to fall your way. But Tyrone played some bloody good stuff that year too. You know, and people are probably quick yeah. to forget that. As well, you know, but I think one of the big things from a Tyrone perspective, was probably the players that lost over the last number of years, even the periphery players, players on the edges like Tiernan McCann, etc., you know, who were having a big impact in games, probably just got to the stage where he just felt, you know, I, I'm not getting enough football, so therefore I'm just going to stick with the club and, and, and pursue all their interests, you know, and you have to probably respect that too, but I think those type of players and the left Tyrone with, with a very, very, uh, what you would probably call, uh, not I wouldn't say second tier squad, but a squad that probably just falls below the top three or four, you know, and and to to compete as you know, you need that depth, you need that bench, you know, and and that's that's a big thing, and we've seen it with Dublin the other day, bringing Jack McCaffrey and Mannion off the bench, mother of God, if you're tired in the last twenty minutes of a game and you see McCaffrey coming on as a wing forward, you'd be you'd be maybe you'd be maybe looking at the line yourself for a change, you know what I mean, you know, and. and that's the reality. And then Mannion coming in for a tired cornerback who's just after chasing fucking Pascal for maybe, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or Costello or whatever for fucking 45, 50 minutes. So, look, you need, you need the bench, you need the strength and depth and, and maybe just Rome just probably didn't have that this year, you know? That, that'll, look, at that'll tie us in uh, uh, the next, in terms of the next game, obviously, in the own county, um, on about Dublin there, like, how... Obviously a disappointing day. It was very, very, very like the Tyrone game in terms of the way it started. Um, promised a lot in the first half, but then kind of died in the second early in the second. It was over within watched watched it again today. It was over after forty minutes. Um, turning point probably was um, the kickouts in terms of Mayo went long. I couldn't get their hands on the primary ball. Uh, mistake, uh, mistake for the goal, and then Dublin were seven points up, and it was good night. Uh, and, Terms of Mayo's transition, they transitioned very quickly in the first half. 
got up the pitch very quickly, two, three passes, score. Then the second half was just very slow and methodical. Like they couldn't they couldn't build up. Look at Old McLaughlin's missed goal as well. I know people will say it wouldn't make it make a difference. But look, think back 2021. You know yourself, CV, as good as anyone as a coach. Momentum, man. You need fucking momentum. And if, if all got that goal, it would be four points in. The crowd would have got behind them. And who knows what would have happened. Because Basquale, don't forget, in 2021, missed a golden opportunity to, uh, to put Dublin 7 up. He didn't take it. And sure enough, Dublin came back, drew the game, and fucking uh, and won by three points in the end. Like So, look, it's, it is fine margins here. But look, Dublin were obviously well, well worth their... Their, their victory in the end here. Uh, how do you feel? How, how, how do you feel about it? The first half, I really, really enjoyed the first half. And I'll tell you what I actually took from the, from the first half. The Derry Court game was so, so slow and methodical yeah. and, you know, and passive. And look, it was, I said, I called this in the show last week. I said, Derry and Cork will be death by a thousand cuts for Cork, you know, and that's the way it was. It just felt like a slow death, you know, just felt like a, you know, look, we're just going to tease you. We're going to toy with you, but we're just going to beat you. And that's the bottom line, you know, because we're, 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 we've got a bit more about us. We're further on down the line and, and our game management is, is probably on a higher level than, than anyone. But the big thing, the big standard thing for me uh, from the Dublin, the Dublin game was the pace of the game early and I thought it was a really high octane, high intensity game, you know, particularly early in the first half. I thought there was some brilliant football played at times. Uh, I thought Mayo gave Dublin their fill of it in the first half. I actually think that Mayo probably left a lot of chances behind them in the first half. And, uh, um, you know, I know Dublin had a, had a couple of chances themselves or whatever, but th- there was a big moment. At, I think it was one, I think it was one four to not eight. And Mayo had a goal disallowed. Now I was behind the goals in the in the canal yeah. end, so I couldn't see to the far side. But um, and that would have put that would have put Mayo four points up, you know. But you know, Mayo Mayo sort of seemed to throw everything at the first half, and uh, and and I felt there was maybe a, a sense of like, fuck me, we're we're one sixth and all eight down here. How how did that happen? You know, how how are we actually behind here when we've just thrown everything at them? You know, and and look. It was very, very evident. McStay touched on it as well from behind the goals, particularly in the uh, particularly in the first half. Actually, the goals that Dublin were playing into the press that Dublin put on Mayo's kickouts. It was a joy to watch. You know, it was really, really impressive to watch. And it's just the size and physicality. So what they're doing is they're backing themselves out the field, and they're backing themselves out the field to, to you know, we don't mind pressing you. We don't mind if 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 you're going to go long here. We're not worried about what's behind us because we've got the physicality, the strength and the experience. Like Scully's back in the team, wing forward, very, very smart wing forward, one of the most one of the most experienced wing forwards probably in the country. He's played the role for a long time. Brought Merchant back in to, to, to play in a in a man marking role. I thought that was a very, very good move. <clears throat> a man with blister and pace. Um his injury he will be a loss for them. Um yeah. You know, I, I just felt the experience that they had. They seemed to just have the bit between their teeth. McCarthy gave a performance in the middle of the field, you know, a performance for the ages, you know, a, a man who's soldiered for a long time now and who started his career probably at, at half back and, and was part of one of the best half back lines, you know, in the history of the game himself and Keanu O'Sullivan and Jack McCaffrey had a little bit of everything in that half back line. And he was in the middle of the field. Obviously Fenton looked looked a wee bit better, better form, but for me, and a, a standout thing for me was, and I said it before, was the ball willing, the, the ball winning ability of their full forward line. But not just the ball winning ability of their full forward line. The way their full forward line can actually manufacture a score. So when they get those one on one situations, they're turning and burning. They're not afraid to take their man on. They're one of the best teams in the country at being really aggressive and brave in that one v one situation. So <coughs> Colin, Colin Callan gets a ball. He faces up his man, goes to shoot, but just takes that bounce and gives himself another three, four steps of explosiveness to get the shot away, you know, and it's it's really impressive to watch. If you watch it in close close nature, like the way they just compose themselves before a shot, but it's the ability that they have and the, the explosive power and the real dynamic nature of that inside lane that makes them, for me, the, the favourites to win this All-Ireland. I thought, I thought, just a touch on that, CB, I thought they kind of helped the uh, defence from me all. Like there was an incident in the second half which kind of summed up for me in terms of Basquell picked it up uh, out on the Cusick side and around the 45 yard line. McBreen was on him, and literally it was one on one up until he got into close up to 21 yard line into the D. Like, are you telling me 
and you could just see everyone minding their own man there, like one on one, and it's that's all well and good, like. But geez, a bit of help defense wouldn't be, you know, the guy coming back as a plus one, or surely someone can get across it. Like a man can't go fucking forty yards there without a hand being put on him here. Like, do you know what I mean? Like oh horror as well. The first half got exposed by Vasquez, but again, he was left one on one. I'd argue. Look at Mayo weren't. I don't. I don't think that. I don't think they were getting a plus one at the back. Dublin. You could see Dublin getting a plus one at the back. I don't understand why they couldn't do that. Um, surely, Joe, you know, with that, as you said, that full forward line, like even even Mannion, the last day, really really shows his kind of. Uh, I'm going to say uh, his growth mindset, where he's thinking about the game. He scored. You know, usually he comes comes in off the right with his left foot. But he checks back now. His two scores came off the right foot on his wing side. Do you know what I mean? So there's more room out there. So instead of coming in the left and coming in on his left, he checks back and do you know what I mean? His so-called weaker foot. But you're getting more. It's a couple of seconds more out out that that side. Like do you know what I mean? So that just shows him thinking about the game. Basquell, he's probably 28, 29 now. He's finally uh, look at. I've seen him in Dublin club football. He's been he's been very very consistent and very very good. For a number of years, so it's 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 nearly a surprise to me. It's taken him this long to kind of break break onto the scene here. Um, and as you said yeah. there, the, boy, the boys that came on, McCaffrey, Kilkenny, Paddy Small, Dean Rock, like the, like their fucking benches back here, and that's that's the yeah, yeah. that's the scary there's, thing. There's no doubt, Anna, that even even the Dublin of old, you know, that one three one four, the score just after half time, like it was like a ten eleven minute blitz. It was like a blitzkrieg, you know. And look, there was a period in that in that ten or eleven minutes where Ryan O'Donoghue had a free kick as well, you know, that made it made it just made it just steady the ship a little bit. Like, but those are massive moments. You have to really step up. And this is where we talk about, and I talked about earlier in the show, particularly in the National League, about the lack of a real top class marquee forward in Mayo. You know, and, and that for me was the big thing. And you know, that that that's the difference in the in the two teams when you have that ruthless nature but that was the Dublin of old you know Dublin were they were really you think I, I always think back to that 2018 game I can never get my head around this like where, where Dublin are 5-1 down against Tyrone in the All-Ireland Final and Tyrone are cruising and this is a Dublin team at that stage that had created this air of invincibility around themselves you know and I was just thinking to myself, man is the game man is the game don't do anything mad now and Tyrone were going that well that they kept going and within like it just felt like a, a click of the fingers it went from like you know, not five to not one, to two, two seven to not five, and the game's over. And you're just going, what, what, what happened there, or where did that come from? You know, and and they did that very, very well on Sunday. That real twelve minute. 11 minute blitzkrieg you know and it's straight after half time and that's game over and that's ga- at that level it's game over there's no you're not coming back from seven or eight points now at intercounty level the way you know teams are conditioned with the the the, the, the game management of teams you know the ability of of the likes of the dubs particularly to manage the ball like it was a brilliant moment in the first half where, where it got a wee bit chaotic and mayo had that sort of you know they turned the game into that sort of madness that they, that they like to turn it into. And Fenton just came out with a hand up in the air. He just had the hand up straight away. And you'll see, we bounce, pop, 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 control the game, bang. Three or four passes later, you know, they've created a scoring opportunity. You know, just settle the whole thing down. And that that's that's in the, in the mental, that's obviously in the mental tank. You know, they have that from obviously previous reigns under Jim Gavin and stuff. The press has been there from from Jim Gavin's time as well. And and obviously bringing in the likes of Pat Gilroy this year and stuff has obviously sort of beefed up the backroom team, you know. So, listen, this Dublin team are are certainly back, in my opinion. And uh, But look, it goes to show you the, important of, the importance of this level too as well, the, t- the highest level. Massive, massive emphasis at, on matchups, and Massive emphasis. Now, matchups are dictated by a number of things, right? You're looking at the personnel you're playing. You're looking at the personnel you have. Who's suited to who? So it's like the old adage, horses for horses. <coughs> you're not going to put a small, fast, dynamic player like Owen Merchant on Aidan O'Shea. It's not going to happen, right? So Owen Merchant might mark a round it on who he's, he's like for like, right? Like, you have to pick your matchups. Patrick O'Hara on Pascal was a, a horror show, an absolute horror show. And obviously that matchup, you know, ultimately probably cost Mayo the game. You know, and it did cost the foundations of the, or, or was was the foundations for the victory for Dublin. And matchups are obviously something that have to be discussed at great length during the week uh, among the management team based on what they've seen video-wise, based on, on you know, how they analyse the opposition and based on what you have. So it just goes to show you as well, you know how important matchups are in the modern game as well, and you know. But, but like one one thing I will say, Stephen, there, like in terms, you're on about the 
the full forward line, the marquee forwards. Like, you know, in fairness, like Rhino, I will, will kind of hit back or kick back there. Like Rhino Donahue and Tommy Connery were, were doing quite well in the first half when I suppose we, we were on about the middle third battle before the week coming up to the game. Like, and like I would, I would probably say like reap small bit of inexperience uh, at the top level in terms of game management where he kept going long in the, the start of the second half. His four yeah. in a row, they lost. Like if they want, like obviously that was a, a ploy by management. To, they said to him to go along here. Well, well, if you're going along every time, sure he's a guy you can overload one side here or get numbers around the break. Uh, they lost four four balls in a row there, and basically uh, Dublin kicked one, two, one, three off that like. So that was the game. Like obviously, look at Ryan and, and Tommy. They, they've obviously you know they're, they're still still quite young. Like, uh, but they were causing Dublin damage. Uh, in the yep. first half, when when we got some k- long kickouts off, when we're mm. uh, breaking even in that middle third battle, now, I don't know was it the intensity levels that dropped fatigue from the last you know three three games in the bounce here, or you know as you said there, Dublin backed themselves. Finch and McCarthy were doing the matchups midfield here. Mayo have like as as we said, like Mayo have plateaued since the league final here. Their their players around the middle third who were going eight nine out of ten have dropped back to a five six out of ten. So it's that was that was a major major issue with that, and oh, it was look at it was, yeah. Look at I'm I'm probably a bit frustrated. Uh, well, listen, from no, I, I, I completely agree. like. Listen, don't get me wrong. Ryan O'Donoghue and Tommy Conroy are brilliant footballers. Brilliant footballers. That that's that's that, that's never in doubt. But I'm talking about that real out and out yeah. marquee man that does something out of nothing. Will stand up. Will win his own ball on a big day. Will create something like a Clifford, like a you know. And I know they're few and far between, like. But yeah. I know. Probably yeah, missing. Yeah, I know. You think of the influence Andy Moran would have had, or Killian O'Connor <laughs> and his plum. Would have had, you know those sort of type of players. And I'm just thinking, you know, yeah. maybe just lacking another forward up there that'll take the heat off. You know, a Tommy Conroy or a Ryan O'Donoghue who aren't the most physically imposing forwards either you know and that's that's the big thing you know so I think that that's obviously something that they're going to have to look at over the winter but for for me from my perspective I, I'm going to be honest with you and uh, um, I, I slightly disagreed with Kevin McStay after to be honest with you I don't know what you felt uh, this has been a really good year I don't think a county like Mayo you know having lost a quarter final as comprehensively as they did against Dublin with such an illustrious management team behind them I, I don't think that that would have been a, a fantastic year. You know, they were beaten in the first round by Connacht and Connacht as well by Roscommon, you know, which is important to note as well. I know they won the league, but the league has probably shown us, particularly with the championship here now, that a lot of teams weren't motoring fully in the league, you know. So I don't know what your take is on it. I, th- I don't know what it is, but I would be thinking that Mayo's expectations would have been a lot, lot higher than, than, than maybe where they fell. Uh, no, I agree. Look, at this, yeah, I, I agree with you. Some people touched on it during the week. Like, you can't, no, it was, it was a, let's be brutally honest here, it was an absolute failure. Like, if they if they maybe won Connacht as well with the league title and, and you know, Dublin nipped them at the post here, uh, but they're comprehensively better. And, uh, you know, they lost to Roscommon, Cork, and Dublin in, in, in the championship this year. So, look, the league is the league. And I look at I was, I was, I was kind of halting my kind of expectations. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't getting overly excited with it because I know it's a long year. Um, even with the Kerry victory, although it was, you know, obviously down in Killarney, it was, it was, a, it was a great victory. Uh, but look at the the Warner signs with Loud were there and with um, with Cork was that as well, obviously. And look, we I did say it like uh, look at times Dublin got people back, and especially in the second half they slowed it up. They got people back, and because Mayo's transition was so slow, and Mayo breaking down that kind of blanket defence, you know, they, they just struggle a lot, like, and you're, you're on about the illustrious backroom team here, like, you know, that's that's part of the job for them to, to go through in the, the, the training ground and, and you know, um, get better at that, basically. So that's, look, that's Kevin, look, Kevin's going to, you know, obviously he's going to be positive after after year one, um, but no, for, to me, it was, you know, uh, absolutely, look, at the league is fantastic to win, brilliant, but um, look, at, at the end of the day, if they bet Cork, Kerry and Dublin would have been playing each other last weekend and uh, Mayo would have been playing Tyrone. So it's fine, fine margins as well. They they fucked up against Cork, let's be brutally honest here. So uh, they paid a, a dear price for it. And, you know, uh, Tyrone and Mayo, you know, Mayo would have had two weeks off. You'd, you'd hazard a guess that they probably would have bet Tyrone and they're into the semi final here. And then we're having a completely different conversation. So as you know well, Stevie, at that level, 
fine margins and that 15 minutes uh, against Cork against fucked them basically. Yeah. Huh? Small margins, yeah, absolutely. Small margins, you know, small margins. Uh, like, but, but it's uh, unfortunately at the county level, it's it's a cutthroat industry, you know, and, and fans, the yeah. the likes, they want results. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. Look at uh, Derry Cork, man, you, you, you touched on it uh, briefly there. The slow. Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking... Well, Listen, look for me. The, the standout, the standout performer for me was was Connor Glass. Uh, I I just don't think it gets enough, it doesn't get enough airtime. It doesn't get enough credit. Uh, you know his positional awareness, his ability to be able to read the sort of counter counter attack. It's on a different level. It's he's he's a colossus. He's an absolute colossus for Derry. Um, you know for me. Uh, he's one of the smartest talents in in GA, and uh, um, his ability to read the game. And I know from 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 speaking to the likes of Marty Clark about <laughs> AFL, that, you know, Marty would have said to me, you know, but the key being in AFL is to to sort of spot the danger before it happens. You know, nearly nearly be aware of of where the play is going to break down and be yeah. in those right areas. And Glass's AFL ba- AFL background obviously allows him to have this positional awareness because a lot of players in the GA don't have it. And, and I was just sitting in awe watching him because the game actually wasn't a great spectacle. I'm not going to lie to you. It didn't get too many people excited. Um, there was a brief moment where Cork got the goal and we thought, oh, you know, here we go. Can Cork yeah. create one of the, sort of the mad momentum moments that they, that they like to, to produce in, in certain games? But they couldn't get a foothold in the kickouts. They, they couldn't get their press going. Um, you know, Derry just controlled the game, uh, got their key matchups right as well. Um, you know, nullified a lot of key forwards for 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 Cork. Uh, but for me, you know, the big big talking point was Glass. You know, I just I just think he's immense. Every time Cork attacked, his ability to be able to read the, the danger, he's either on the D, cut out a, in a position to cut out a kick pass, or or he senses the danger and needs to press out and engage the opponent straight away. And I just thought he was superb at that. And I just think he does not get anywhere near enough credit, you know, and I think that he is the critical cog in this Derry machine. And and Derry, be under no illusions, they had obviously been through a huge upheaval midway through the season, losing their manager, okay, and Kieran Mina obviously had a step into the breach. But Mina has done it with, with great dignity, great respect. He's obviously carried on brilliant piece of coaching as well because they're they're very, very well drilled. Um, you know, they're a seriously, seriously well organized side. One big standout feature of their attack was how narrow they attack. They are going to be a nightmare for Kerry when Kerry sit down to analyze them because it will be a sort of a that this this is going to be tough. This is going to be tough, and they'll not make it easy. You know, and and you can predict a couple of matchups already. You know, you can predict the likes of of McKeague and on the Clifford. Clifford. That will be that will be a battle of of all battles. You know, in in, in my opinion, like. But listen, there's there, there's going to be obviously a period now of of two weeks where where both teams are going to have a good look at each other. But it, it's certainly a draw that I would say Kerry would have been hoping to have Monaghan over Derry, you know, and that's that's the reality. I think Kerry would have been much more at ease, especially after the beating that they gave Monaghan this year in, in the National League. But but this Derry side, I'm telling you now, and uh, I, I just don't I believe the narrative that can't play in Crow Park. Their football at times can be very, very hard to watch, and I agree with that, okay, the way they're very slow and meticulous about everything they do. But it, but it's it's goddamn effective and it's getting them results and there they are on back to back all Ireland semi finals and they're back in the one. Even 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 the we said the goal. Interesting you said that scene. Like obviously Maguire scored the uh, goal for Cork. I think it was the forty seven minute and then then uh, it was a Doherty. Doherty came up in the forty eight minute and scored that goal. But did they? You were at the game. I think look at the shoulder on telly from the back of the goal. Did it? I think Derry overloaded one side and then they fucking they brought it across and they got a got a kind of two on one or three v two there and they yeah. worked it very well. And, huh? Yeah, the way the way the way they mix their attack up is is impressive yeah. to watch. They're, they're creating they create a very narrow attack at times, which allows for a lot more screening. It allows for people then to come on the loop, you know, and it just it just sort of condenses the pitch a little bit, you know, and ask it just asks different questions of of a team defensively, I, you know. And I, I, I don't I don't think. Sorry, go on there. No, I, I presume, you know how they get four. I kind of presume you're on about there, the slow and uh, meticulous how they attack. They get four in the full forward line. I presume that's just a way to basically, they're they're clearing the 10 and 12 laneways for them and the boys in the full forward line are coming out off the shoulder and fucking, you know, coming on their right foot, their strong foot or whatever, left foot, and they're popping over the bar. Like, that's that's the reason, like, because the four in the full forward line is very, very unusual. 
yeah, well, well, at some times you can be five in there, and and I suppose what what you're looking to do, and what most teams will look for in their attack is they'll look for width and depth, you know. Yeah. And Derry will do that at times, but what Derry are actually doing is keeping it very deep and very narrow, and they're one of the best teams in the country at backing themselves in one v one situations. The likes of yeah. of Ethan Doherty, Paul, like Paul Cassidy, for example, in the first half broke through for a brilliant brilliant score could have been a goal you know they'll back themselves the situation McCluskey from cornerback came up in the championship against Monaghan you know isolated himself at a 1v1 situation with uh, with Conor McManus at the time took him on and, and scored a goal you know and they're yeah. very very confident they're very confident and they're very dynamic in those 1v1 areas and that's something obviously they're trying to manipulate in their attack you know as those 1v1 situations but they're just asking different questions end off a team so if a team sit in zonally against them and you're sitting in with you know, two sweepers dropped down on the other side of the D. You're playing a sort of a deep line zone of defence. Derry are all of a sudden asking different questions. They're squeezing you back to the end line. They're, they're putting a lot of depth in their attack. They're then yeah. playing that and clustering around the D. So they're clustering around the sweepers. Okay, so the sweepers are then occupied. And then that all of a sudden creates all the situations where, for example, Oren Lynch, you know, can break forward. Was was a lucky not to get a score the other day as well. Broke forward, had a clip to score at the edge of the D. Keeper just caught it just above the crossbar. He creates, he has come out this year and created the plus one as well. But they're also backing themselves in on kickouts as well. They're going after teams hard and heavy. Yeah. So they're back in glass, they're back in Rogers, they're bringing Orr Lynch out, they're crowding that middle third, and the glass in the second half, and mother of God, like not even just his positional sense in when Derry lost possession of the ball, but on the opposition's kickouts, his ability to read where the kickout was going, get a cross, get a big fist on it, or get a catch, you know, or, or break a ball. It was just immense. He was just when, absolutely immense. When you say, Stephen, his positional sense, you know, when, when Derry loses, does he run straight back to six, or what, what does he do there? Like? Not necessarily, not necessarily, because what, what actually happens then, it depends on the situation or what type of counter-attack it is. Like, But he is the man who filters back. He he knows where the danger is defensively. You know, he sometimes drops off. I have a great picture on my phone, actually, where he dropped off at the D, or sometimes he might pick up, you know, a bit of loose or whatever who's lying about. But he just reads the game superbly well. And from a defensive point of view, he's the one player, actually, who tends to make a lot of contact and a lot of engagement with the ball carrier. You know, and it, it's... It's, it's, it's a supreme skill, like, and it's a skill that he's obviously developed and an awareness he's obviously developed in the during his time in professional sport, you know, because it is something for me in the GA that, that, is, uh, that, that is missing in a lot of players where they can't sense the danger, they can't spot the danger, or they don't know when the right moment is to engage. And Glass is the best in the country at it. He's easily the best in the country at it, you know, and it's going to take, like, for me, it'll take every piece of... of of Kerry's guile and know-how and experience to, to, to get a run on this dairy well, team. Well, well, what is, go on, sir. Yeah, no, no, the, key, the, key, the key is for Derry to stay in the game. If Derry turn it into an arm wrestle, if Derry yeah. can turn it into an arm wrestle, which they've done in all the big games so far this year, turn it into that sort of arm wrestle, then I think they have a big chance. I think they have a big chance. Uh, no, I, I don't dispute that. No, Jack, Jack always had a little joy at the, the critics after the game in terms of, you know, and, uh, I didn't think we had a midfield ourselves. Like, so, but, like, we're all about the midfield period of, of O'Connor and Barry, and obviously, like, this is this is a, a mouth-watering uh, matchup here in terms of Rodgers and Glass uh, with them two now because the, t- the four of them can, can run all day here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Glass... Roger, the class of Roger is probably the, just a nudge of the field of ability here as well. Well, for me, I, I've said a number of times before, I think Connor Glass and Brennan Rogers are, are possibly the best pairing in Ireland at the minute. At the present moment in time, based on, on, on the midfield pairings that we see, obviously Fenton and McCarthy's performance on Sunday would run yeah. them close. Yeah. And obviously, historically, historically, Fenton and McCarthy on paper would look straight away as your number one. But in current form... yeah. And what they've done over the past season or two, you know, for me, Glass and Rogers have developed a wonderful understanding and a, and a really, really good partnership, and they, you know, yeah, yeah, no, big time, big time. Um, look, yeah, the, like Derry, just looking here, Derry had a good spread of scores here in terms of one, two, seven, seven different scores the last day. Um, look, and that wasn't that wasn't an easy fixture of Cork, like Cork, Cork did, like, mm-hmm. look, they ran Kerry very close, they bet me all, like, they're, they're, fucking, they're a tough enough team to get over here. And Derry closed turnovers. out. Turnovers kill them, and you know you, you you're talking about Armagh, or you're talking about yeah. Tyrone. Turnovers, turnovers, like turnovers to Derry, or you know they're like sweets to. You just love to see them coming, you know, and yeah. that's the thing. Whenever a team carries the ball against Derry and carries it into contact, like it's like a wee child at Christmas, but you just just the eyes are open, and you know, and the the, the Christmas lights are on, and the Derry defence, and they're thinking, here we go, showtime again, you know, and that's. 
that's the reality, you know. That's 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 the, uh, last. Uh, we'll get on to the last game. So the uh, tell you what, this was eventful anyway. It was it was fucking. It was it was a tough watch. We we'll said the the game itself, but obviously when it got into extra time and the excitement of it, our man obviously Monaghan. Uh, what did you make of it? Yeah, well, I missed the first half because the wee girl was down in, in Antrim and then Gormley actually playing in the Fela. Um, they actually won the wee shield at the Fela uh, in Nuri Shamrock, so it was brilliant, brilliant for them. Like, But it was a great day out, actually. They were away all day. Uh, two different venues, St. Uh, St. Joseph's Glen Avey, wonderful venue, and um, St. Enda's Glen Gormley. Um, you know, a club, St. Enda's Glen Gormley as well, and worth, worth noting, had, had put up with an awful lot in their history and their past as well, you know, from a political point of view, so it was fantastic to see that but no I got up the road for the second half and, and I got up the road for extra time and, and penalties and I seen it on TV and, and listen look you know just arm again you know we're scratching our heads thinking to ourselves how did they not win the game in normal time and you just had that eerie sense of feeling when it went to penalties ah listen there's only going to be one winner and again a big thing obviously you know the experience of begging as, a, as an out and out goalkeeper yeah. maybe his gloves on a couple of penalties that maybe you know maybe Ethan couldn't get his hands on you know um, look I've, I sort of felt a bit sorry as well for Callum Comiskey he missed two penalties um, you know in, in the one shootout and that, that that's tough for any young fella you know and I'm sure his, his teammates and his and his friends and that rally, will rally around him and it's it's a horrible way to, to lose a game but it, it's it's unbelievable excitement like we, we landed <laughs> We landed back into the Nuri Shamrocks club and all the girls were getting pizzas and stuff. And, you know, they had the game on the big screen. Like, and all of a sudden, everyone just crowded around the screen for the penalty shootout. Like, and it was just pure, like for us as neutrals, it's pure entertainment. It's pure drama, you know, and it, it's 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 sort of like, you know, it, it's it's something that I think has added to to the game a little bit. Now, I know there's there's arguments for, like, my father would be a bit of a traditionalist, like, and he was ringing at me on Sunday, giving off, saying, why is that not a replay next week, you know? And I was saying, well, it had to be played to finish with, with the condensed season. Like, But, look, Conor McManus, I, I don't think there can be enough superlatives wrote about him. Uh, you know, the man for the big occasion, he, he, he won the free at the end as well. You know, clipped a, an unbelievable free from, from under the Hogan stand as well, you know, and... and you know, and scored his two. <laughs> you can't really ask for for much more, you know. Um, but uh, he he's. Can I just say, uh, say like, Vinnie Corey first has managed that situation very well because he comes. He's obviously come in this first year. You know, I, yeah. I know we're, like that. You see, kind of different dynamics and the older players being kind of, you know, kind of nudged out the door, small bit. Yeah. And obviously, look at managing that and. Obviously, Kieran News came on the last day. McManus, Garen News has kind of started up when he was, you know, kind of drifting and on the team at the start of the year. And just, you know, them the older statesmen, ego, obviously, uh, and pride, obviously, come into play here when you're coming to the end of your career. You don't, you know, McManus, obviously, yeah, he's been, look at, he's, he's one of the best forwards of all time here. Let's let's be honest. Yeah. In his, McManus' his heyday was absolutely oh, outrageous stuff. Uh, uh, a GA, a GA sensation, like a sensation yeah, yeah, yeah. of the that's yeah, me. And so, look, look, I think the big challenge there, and what you're saying there about Vinny, is that a lot of these boys he would have played with. You yeah. know, the Darn Hughes, the Rory Baggins, I'm just looking at the list here. You know, he probably, yeah, he would have played, he would have played with McCarthy. Uh, he he would have played with, um, just looking here, uh, Karen might have been about Jesse Ward, certainly. Uh, Kieran Hughes, Conor McManus, you know, quite a, quite a large proportion. Fenton Kelly actually still around that panel. You know, a large proportion yeah. of those lads he would have played with. So, that can have an advantage, but it can also be a huge disadvantage as well. Yeah. You know, when managing your, your your peers that you played with, like. But no, he he has handled it very well. Finney's a shrewd operator, you know, and and Martin Corey, his brother, is a very very shrewd coach as well, you know, and and obviously, look, Monaghan have a huge amount of experience. Like I I do think, and uh, like I'm not being disrespectful to them. Like I do think this is the end of the road for them. You know, I think that this is probably. You know, as good as it gets for Monaghan, unfortunately, I just don't think they've got the the capabilities of the teams to beat Dublin, and and that's not me being disrespectful. I think Monaghan are a fantastic side. I think Monaghan, probably Monaghan's best opportunity ever to get to an All Ireland final was when Malachy Rourke was there in 2018, and they were beaten by Tyrone uh, by a point in an All Ireland semi final. They were grossly unlucky, and a lot of those players five six years ago were in their prime, you know, and yeah. and playing the best 
all of their careers. And I'm sure they might look back on that as maybe one that, that, that you know, not got away, but certainly won the opportunity to get to an All-Ireland final. And I think the glass ceiling for this group probably would be an All-Ireland final, you know. Um, are Monaghan good enough to beat Derry or beat Dublin and then go on to beat Kerry? Or, or, or I, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. You know, and I think that realistically, anyone looking outside now, the group will believe because you know they're they're a very very tight group. They they've they have they have obviously a phenomenal level of of spirit and togetherness about them. But then to be under no illusions, you know, Carl O'Connor and Conor McCarthy, we talked about them last week. Their impact from half back in this team is is, is huge. It's yeah. huge, you know. Uh, Michal Banahan at, at, at centre half forward is is Good player. a brilliant, brilliant season, brilliant season for him. You know, Jack McCarron has stepped up this year. Guy Mohan is a real out and out ball winner. You know, really aggressive, powerful ball winner. Desi Ward brings a huge amount of experience to the group as well. Look, they've they've, they've got a good, they've got a good side. They have got a good side, but yeah. I just don't know where you're going to plug the holes against Dublin. I think they're going to be looking, going right. Where's our matchups? Who do we do? And I just think there's too many. There's just, just too many variables to, to beat Dublin there, you know. Um, like with Emma, obviously, look at that. Like I mentioned yesterday, Reid O'Neill as well. He obviously stepped up against Goy last year with the final three, and then he had a bomb to uh, we, we all thought he, he, he was the match winner here on the outside of the boot from 45 yards. Like it was his sensational score. And then obviously, Bikini was coming on. Um, I'm a timekeeper. Was that, I don't know, was that normal time or extra time? I'm not sure. I can't think of it now. I, I, normal time, 78 minutes or something. I look, I've, I have a stickler about this end of myself. I think. I've never seen a sport that creates as much injury time as the GA. And even <laughs> even in school... No, honestly... It's got more. I remember it's, got, it's definitely got more now, Stevie. The last few years, it's got oh, ridiculous. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Like, I, remember, I remember in a school match, and this is no word of a lie, a school match about 10 years ago and down in Park Eisler when we were playing... Uh, former school of mine, St. Clemens Kilkeel, were playing St. Mark's, and the game, it was like an under 14 game, there was seven and a half minutes injury time. I think they scored a goal with the last kick of the game to win by a point. I'll never forget that. And you just wonder to yourself, where did, where did they get this this level of injury time? And I think McGinney made the point of, you know, the referee is nearly playing God for teams, like, you know, he's dictating how much injury yeah. time there is, and only human nature. If there's a point in the game, and the crowd's up, and the excitement's up, and the time's up, and the opposition have the ball, and they're attacking... It should be the final whistle. Like in soccer, it doesn't matter if a ball's in mid-air going into a penalty box in soccer and it's 1-0 or it's 2-1 and there's six men in the penalty box ready to head it into the net. Full-time it blows. It's irrelevant. Like, but we have this tendency to nearly play on and give them another chance, you know, and it's 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 madness. Like, it's absolute madness and I think the only way to control it is, particularly at inter-county level, is, is the shot clock, you know, or not the shot clock, sorry, the the, 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 the timer, you know, yeah. the in, in the ladies' football because... Yeah. Or have a fourth official that controls it, or whatever, and because it has got, and uh, honestly, it's got ridiculous. And I've said this for a number of years. I said this a number of years ago. I thought the level of timekeeping, like Monaghan were robbed a number of years ago in uh, when Dublin were in their real prime in a national league game. I never forget it. Actually, they were something like eight and a half minutes in injury time. Like Dublin, Dublin kept the equaliser. You know, and it was just madness. You were going, where does this time come from? You know, so look, they reckon. They reckon 30 seconds for a substitution. I was so, going to say that. I was going to say that. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's 10, there's five minutes straight away, like, which is non, nonsensical, like, you know what I mean? Because yeah. substitution can be made straight away. If a team's chasing the game, subs run off in five seconds. Five seconds. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Subs no, run off in five seconds. Like, well, so. well, well, like, for, for no, obviously, you see, we're having, like, Armagh here, like they're going to be. We said this uh, last week. Like, if Armagh were to lose this game, it's going to be absolutely heartbreaking and stuff here. Like, you know, obviously, uh, this is two years down the road. Uh, for two, like, penalty, penalty shootouts, actually. They've, they've obviously lost. Um, you know, is it like, I, I like, I, yeah, it's just, is it, I don't want to say, is a change, is a change coming or like, do they need a change? I, I never would advocate for someone like losing their, their job here, like, but. Like this, you know, like this is kind of our man. Like Donny came in this kind of year three with Donny, I think, and McGinney as as a kind of pair together. This is Vinnie Corey's first year under Monaghan. To be honest, like Monaghan should not be getting like if we. There's no way in hell anyone in the country would say Monaghan would be in the last four of an all Ireland series at the start of the year. Absolutely no, no way. Um, so it's just it's just like where do our man go from here? Well, look, it's it's very straightforward. It's like this. Um, I'm going to reverse that question. Where did Armagh come from before here? So yeah. before, you want to go, you know, uh, before McGinney. And yeah. obviously 
you know, people are obviously looking for change. Arma, I think Arma people are very, very, very ambitious. I'm just going to say that. I think they're very ambitious in 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 the reading of where they feel their squad is and where they feel their team is. I think there's a lot of really good footballers in that team. Yeah. Um, is there enough footballers in that team to win in All Ireland? People might say no, but he is certainly ingrained the level of belief in them that they that they feel they can contest. You know, at, at the latter stages of the championship. I think the last two years they've been very, very unlucky to go out in the quarterfinal, so we haven't had an opportunity to see them in a semi-final. But certainly what he has done for me and uh, is very straightforward. He has brought in a culture and into the group where you know the players are in a very, very high performance environment. They have yeah. Julie Davis, who has added a level of consistency to the S and C. Uh, they have a group of players there that have committed to Armagh now for a long, long number number of years. Uh, who are developing physically, who are developing, you know, a mental toughness about them as well. Um, you know, they they have a few issues in a few positional areas in their team. I'm looking through their team here now, and I'm, I'm certainly thinking that, you know, there's one or two areas now that, 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 that could be exploited by a really, really good side. But for me, and uh, unquestionably, I think Kieran McGinney has maximised what he has there. I think he's got the best players playing for Armagh. Armagh club football is not on a spectacular level. I watch a good bit of it myself. I'm very, very local. Yeah. I, I live minutes from, from the Armagh uh, down border. You know, Armagh underage teams are not shooting the lights out either. There's not a conveyor belt of massive talent coming through. He picked up this group when they were bottom of Division 3, uh, got them to, to third in Division 1 last year, you know, Ulster final, hasn't had the silverware, hasn't had the trophies to show for it. But really and truly, when you look back over the last seven or eight years, who has won the All-Ireland? Dublin six times, yeah. or sorry, Dublin seven times over the last eight or nine years, Dublin seven times, and Kerry once, Tyrone once, you know, and you're sort of thinking to yourself then, there's only one trophy can be handed out, and, and Ulster is just so difficult to win, you know, it's so difficult to win, like, it's been, what has it been now, 30 years since Down won an Ulster title, 30 years, you know, next year will be 30 years since Down won an Ulster title, Ulster titles don't grow in threes, they're very, very difficult to win, they're very, very hard to win, you know. So I think Arma people probably have, particularly this generation, maybe have that sort of oh, early yeah. naughty, mid naughties, you know, that that sort of group where they're thinking, Jesus, you know, we should be winning Ulsters every year, and it doesn't work like that, in it, it doesn't work like that. And it's it's like the old adage, grass is always greener on the other side, you know. And and I remember, like you know, just years ago, my father sort of saying to me about jobs and stuff like that. Everybody always thinks that there's something better out there, you know. I'm all right where I am, but I would love to be there, or I think that's better, or this is better. It's not always the way, you know, and, and just careful what you wish for, you know, who will take the job, because whoever comes in and takes the job, you're probably having to start from scratch again, because I'm sure that the likes of Julie Davis, the backroom team, they'll all go as well. If he goes, they'll go. But when you've got a manager that all the players love and admire and respect, you're halfway there. You're halfway yeah. there, you know, and maybe you can talk about luck, but there is a huge element of luck in management. It's a massive timing and luck is everything. If you're in the right place at the right time and you get a wee bit of luck and a wee bit of momentum, you know, it makes you, it makes you, you know, but if you're just, if your timing's off and a lot of the time, you know, it comes down to just timing and, you know, if you're in the, if you're in the right job at the right time, things go well for you and all of a sudden then you're made, you know, and there's probably been a pressure on Kieran, you know, because the, the silverware and the trophies haven't arrived, but, I generally don't think that that should be a measure of success for Arma. You know, I don't. I don't. I think that the, the, the level of success and how they should measure success is where the group have come from and where the group are now, even from a culture perspective, you know, and I think that's important to note. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's very comprehensive, in fairness. Uh, no, look, uh, obviously people are going to... You know, look, you, you've been around the block, so you know how these things go if, after a crushing defeat like that. People are always uh, are going to be asking them questions like, you know, the, as you said, the grass is always greener. Uh, look, at McGinney has, has done a really good job. Uh, it's obvious, Look at that Ulster. I, to me, he just needs an Ulster title just to kind of cement uh, that progress he's made over a number of years as where they've come from. It's probably frustrating on his part, that's all. Um, so, look... Um, yeah, well, no, look, as you, I suppose it's like anything. It's like you know, it's like, it's like society in general. Like people just want instant success. They just want yeah. change. If something's not working, fix it. Mobile phone's not great, right? Get rid of it. Get a new one. You know, my car, yeah, right? Yeah. Get rid of it. Just yeah. get some. You know, it's the society we live in. You know, and particularly supporters and the likes of that. You know, can be very, very fickle. People involved in football in general end are fickle. You know, <laughs> football people are 
you know, they just want, if it's not working, get rid of them. You know, it's no good or whatever. This isn't working. You've one bad performance, the team's not fit. You know, you've two bad performance, he doesn't have a clue. You know, and it's just, it's it's mad like how, how society and football in general is. And I think the other side of it as well, too, Andy, which is important to note as well, the toxicity, the toxicity that exists now because social media has created now a vacuum of, of, of clowns that can actually just say what they like with no no accountability whatsoever can abuse and do say whatever they want to you, you know could be real real you know cut cut ribbon st- stuff and there's no accountability at all you know and that's that's the big thing as well of 2023 is that it's the sort of social media brigade that you know get rid of him get rid of him and just get somebody new we're not happy and and people can actually look at that and think that that's what everyone in that county or that place believes and it's probably not you know us proper football people ask people who are who are knowledgeable you know and probably as well one thing that that he has probably done as well is from a from a county board perspective is that probably raised a lot of money for the county as well you know which a lot of other people haven't done and has dedicated a lot of time and has has got the time to dedicate to the job and uh, beyond no illusions it is a full-time job a full-time job oh i know i know don't worry look at on that note Sibby, always a pleasure man yeah we'll see you good to chat good to chat Come on. Bye bye. Bye bye.